Smoking kills. Not particularly the most controversial statement I know. The effects of the habit normally come after some years after taking it up. But every once in a while, smoking has immediate repercussions. Today's story is just that. Except rather than heart disease and cancer being the killer, burning alive and or smoke inhalation at a football match are the fatal outcome. Our subject today bridges the nightmare fuel gap between two British horrors of the 1980s, mass casualties at a football game and sudden fires on board a wooden structure. Today, we are looking at the tragic Bradford City Stadium fire. My name is John and welcome to Plainly Difficult. background. I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not really a massive football fan. I know, I know it is a bit unlike someone living in the UK. I found that most conversations between men revolve around football and my lack of leg sphere knowledge has hindered my casual communication with builders, taxi drivers and work colleagues etc. Coming to think of it, even amongst people who have the same interests as me, I struggle with human interactions. Good job, 95% of my day job requires me to work alone. Hardly the biggest sob story I know, but today is a story involving an appendage round that is up my alley. Sadly, it involves tragedy, resulting from the age-old reasons, ignorance and legacy infrastructure. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. This is Bradford City Football Club's grounds, which is around here on a map. It's known, well, for the purpose of today's video, as the Valley Parade. Originally built as a rugby ground in 1886, however, at the turn of the century, the club changed from rugby football to football, or for use across the pond, soccer. So I'm not going to do a deep dive into this, as even looking at this bit of history started shutting my brain down. Sport and John just really don't mix. Well, in 1903, the Manningham Rugby Club changed to Bradford City Association Football Club. The Valley Parade was kept pretty much identical to its 1880s layouts until the team started getting some successes. The 1907 to 1908 Division 2 season resulted in a winning of the championship for the club. This meant that they would ascend into Division 1, or the highest level at the time of English football. Because of this, the rather old, unaltered rugby ground needed some modernisation. This resulted in the club bringing in football architect Archibald Leach. He would pen the club's new main stand, a massive structure capable of seating 5,300 with additional space for a standing paddock at the front for another 7,000 people. The main stand was 90 metres long. To the rear there were turnstiles and gates, which were higher than the pitch in elevation. It was separated longitudinally by a wooden fence. And speaking of wood, the building all over the main stand was steel columns with wooden trusses and purlins. On top of that, all of the seating on the stand was timber supported upon more wood. There were also plastic seating areas on the stands. All of this was rather flammable. Parts of the ground would be changed over the years, but importantly, one part that was hardly touched was the mega structure that was the main stand. The high point in the club's performance, which prompted the initial rebuild of the grounds, would turn into a gradual tail off, dropping the team down to the fourth tier of English football, which, as I find rather confusingly, is today's League 2. I don't really understand that, but the important thing is clubs earn less money the lower they are down in English professional football. Hardly surprising, as there are less sponsors and all that jazz. As such, with less money coming into an organisation, this usually results in less money being spent on renovations, repairs, cleaning and modernisation. One area of concern was the ability for rubbish to collect below the wooden main stand. This debris would become a fire risk, especially in the days of people smoking all the time. On a number of occasions, this concern was brought up by the local council. But the team's fortunes would change in the early 1980s, as Bradford City started creeping up the scoreboards. Plans were in place to begin working on rebuilding the main stand, which was still being delivered to the grounds. 
but it would be a little bit too late. And this leads us rather neatly onto a fateful day in May 1985. Disaster. It is the 11th of May 1985, and two football teams are getting ready to face off. The game was between Bradford City and Lincoln City, and was the final match of the 1984-1985 to Football League season. Bradford City had gone into the match in good spirits, but had gained enough points to be promoted up to the next league above. Kickoff occurred at 4 minutes past 3pm, and for the first half of the game, everything was pretty boring. No one scored. But around 3.40pm, when the first half was just in its last few minutes, fire could be seen from the back of Block G of the main stand. Supporters noticing the smoke began to try to escape the stand. The heat, smoke and flames were coming out between the gaps in the floorboards. Some fans jumped the wall onto the pitch. Within moments, the whole of the main stand was engulfed in flames. Thick black smoke bellowed out, spilling into the areas behind the stand, obscuring many people's exit. Debris from the now burning roof fell onto trapped spectators still stuck on the stand. Now, there were no fire extinguishers available to the crowd. This was because the 1980s was rife with football hooliganism, in which anything and everything could and would be used as a weapon and thus were kept out of the reach of punters. The exits to the main stand had been padlocked during the game. This became an area where fans couldn't escape. Within a few minutes of the fire beginning, fire brigade crews attended the scene and began battling the flames. It would take several hours before the numbers of victims could be ascertained. As firemen worked through the stand, all that remained was charred seating and a number of burnt bodies of which some were reportedly still sitting upright in their seats. This just shows how quickly the fire had spread. Victims of the fire, who were still alive, were whisked off to hospital, but many would succumb to their wounds, which was the effects of smoke inhalation, while still receiving medical care. Police ambulance and fire crews would scour through the fire-damaged wreckage. The final victim's body wouldn't be removed from the stand until 4am the next day. The game was being filmed at the time, and later that day, clips of the footage would be shown on the news. The disaster caused 56 people to lose their lives. The highest number, some 27, were killed by Exit K, near the closed gates. Some victims were found to have even been trampled to death. In addition to the death toll, around 265 supporters were also injured to varying degrees. The disaster was looking like one of the deadliest in British sporting history since the Crusher Ibrox Stadium. Link to my video on the subject will be around here. As such, an inquiry was required to find the cause of the fire and to see if and how tragedy could have been avoided. Thus, we will now go on to the next section of our video. Aftermath an investigation. The investigation could be considered to be split into three different portions. The first being how the fire started. This would manifest itself into the chaired by Sir Oliver Popperwell Popperwell inquiry. The next would be the way in which victims died. This would be led by Coroner James Turnbull. And the third was a High Court case against Bradford City, West Yorkshire County Council and the Health and Safety Executive for the liability of the injuries and deaths incurred by the victims of the fire. So first let's look at the Popperwell inquiry. Judge Oliver Popperwell was appointed on the 13th of May as the head of an inquiry into the disaster. Just a quick side note, in 1975 he had worked on a defence of someone rather well known, his godson, called Stephen Fry at a trial on the charge of credit card fraud. Anywho, there were two hearings for the inquiry, in which the best part of 100 witnesses were called, where the final inquiry occurred in June 1985, after which a report would be released in July the same year. During the inquiry's interviews, multiple reports of punters seeing a build-up of debris below the floorboards of the stand, where one of the cases of a gap being so large that a scarf was lost and unretrievable. Other witnesses stated about the amount of paper rubbish and empty cigarette packs that had built up, and due to its location, it was very difficult to clear out. 
Importantly, during the inquiry, malicious intent was ruled out, as stated in the report. Superintendent Clapham found no evidence of paint or accelerant or gas cylinders or anything of that nature which could have caused or contributed to the fire. I conclude that the fire was not started by any malicious means. Popperwell would give his final following verdict. I am quite satisfied that the cause of the fire was the dropping of a lighted match or a cigarette or tobacco onto debris beneath the floorboards in rows I or J, in between the seats 141 and 143. It is quite impossible to determine who caused the fire to start. Indeed, it would be grossly unfair to point the finger at any one person. Bizarrely, the inquiry would also include another football disaster that occurred on the same day, which would lead to accusations of the Bradford City fire being kind of downplayed. On top of that, the inquiry would only last seven days, and reading it kind of makes you feel like there's a bit missed out. But although the ignition was it accidental, clearly there was negligence on the part of the grounds, as the club knew the stand had issues. They were planning on refurbishing it after all, ironically just a few days after the fateful day. Popperwell would recommend the banning of wooden stands, as well as better fire marshalling, improved evacuation training for staff and police, as well as adequate exits provided in all sports grounds and the banning of smoking on combustible stands. Although in the face of criticism, Popperwell would defend his work decades later. Next came the cause of death in the form of the coroner inquiry. This was headed up by James Turnbull, and the coroner's inquest brought the verdict of death by misadventure. Next would be the test case. Fletcher and others versus Bradford City Football Club and others. Evidence was brought showing the club's negligence. This was based on a number of letters between the health and safety executive and club members, which highlighted that they knew the stand was unsafe, including the following quote from a 10th of September 1980 letter. In the main stand, the void area between the concrete supporting structure and the wood floor should, after removal of rubbish, be completely blocked off. Deputy High Court Judge Sir Joseph Cantley noted blame on the 23rd of February 1987 in court. In my view, the continuing negligence of the club and the continued inaction or indifference of the County Council for its various departments and in both of its capacities, after it had been alerted to the existence of the danger, were concurrent causes of the disaster, and I hold both of them liable to damages to the plaintiff. This would result in a compensation claim for 154 claimants, reportedly totalling as high as £20 million. The club grounds would be rebuilt. However, Bradford City's fortunes would never really get much further out of the lower leagues of professional British football. So it's scale time. It's going to be a five. And this is what I've got for the bingo card. Do you agree? This is a plenty of foot production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plenty of videos are produced by me, John, in the currently not too bad corner of southern london uk i have twitter second youtube channel and instagram to so check them all out if you want to see all odds and sods of bits and pieces i get up to outside of making videos and i'd like to say a very warm thank you to all of my patreon and youtube members for your financial support as well as the rest of you for tuning in every week and all that's left to say is thank you for watching and mr music play us out please